Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's plenary session. My name is Ambre Luguet, and I'm co-chair of the Conference Science Committee. I have the pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Catherine Goodenough. So Dr. Catherine Goodenough is a principal geologist and an international lead with the British Geological Survey. Her research focuses on the geology of critical raw material resources, particularly the rare earth element and lithium. She is a principal investigator on a project uh, called Lithium for Future Technology that was recently funded by UK Natural Environment Research Council and which aims at better understanding lithium geological cycle. Today, Catherine Stoke is going to address um, actually how those crucial resources are affecting the society transition to a more sustainable energy supply. Catherine, thank you very much for being with us today, and now I turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Ombre, and uh, thanks everybody for coming to this plenary. I hope this is going to be interesting for you. So I'm going to talk about critical raw materials for the energy transition. And the first and really important thing that I have to say is that, yes, I'm standing up here giving the plenary, but it's not about me, it's about all of my fantastic collaborators that I work with, and you can see some of their names up there. And a lot of the work that I'll talk about in reality was done by them. Uh, so it's great having such a good team of people working in this area. And that work is being done on this four big funded projects we've had recently, funded by the Natural Environment Council and the European Union, although I am from the UK, so don't ask me about the EU. <laughs> so why are we doing this? You know, what's our interest in critical raw materials? And of course, it goes to the biggest challenge that society faces today, and that, of course, is climate change. And this is uh, Ed Hawkins from Reading University created this brilliant representation of climate change where he's taken temperatures for each year over the last 170 years and assigned them a colour just to show how much change there's been. And you can really see it's such a powerful way of looking at it and thinking we have got to do something to tackle climate change. And of course the answer to that is we need an energy transition. We need to move towards net zero carbon emissions. And if you look at the IPCC, this is a diagram from the recent Working Group 3 report about how we're going to tackle climate change and how we're going to mitigate some of the issues. They're looking at the adoption of the technologies that we need to use to move away from fossil fuels, to move away from big CO2 emissions. And we're looking here at really wind power, solar power, and electric vehicles. And this diagram shows really nicely how over the last 20 years or so, we've had much more significant adoption of those technologies and they've really come down in cost. But those technologies being so important to us means something else and something that's really critical for us as geologists and geochemists. It means, of course, this quote that comes from Sally Malley and others from five years ago in a Nature paper, a transition to a low carbon society will require vast amounts of metals and minerals. The world cannot tackle climate change without an adequate supply of raw materials to manufacture clean technologies. And that is really where we come in. Because the critical raw materials that we need for the energy transition, for renewable energy, for electrification, for electric vehicles, are so wide ranging and varied uh, and things often that we haven't really mined in very significant amounts before. So right now, everyone's talking about batteries. And for batteries, of course, for all the electric vehicles that we're all going to be driving soon, they contain lithium, graphite, cobalt, nickel, manganese, and also vanadium, potentially in vanadium flow batteries. The motors that drive those electric vehicles or indeed drive the wind turbines that are spreading all over the place, those, those motors contain high-strength magnets. 
And for those magnets, you need the rare earth elements, particularly neodymium, praseodymium, and dysprosium. As an aside, when someone says heavy rare earth elements are more important, really, for the energy transition, it's those three rare earth elements that are most important. For solar panels, we need gallium, we need in indium, we need tellurium, we need selenium. So minor metals that haven't been produced much in the past, but are critical for solar panels. And for hydrogen, there's a lot of talk about the hydrogen economy, almost as though it might solve this problem. But for um, electrolysis to produce green hydrogen, you need huge amounts of platinum group elements. And they really are quite rare. Then for alloys, if we want our electric vehicles to have bodies that are strong yet light, we need things like aluminium, we need niobium, magnesium, titanium. And then just for electrification, for things like the electric grids, we need copper, we need zinc, we need silver, and a whole host of other metals. So all of these raw materials really are essential to the energy transition. And some of them we refer to as critical because there are some concerns around the security of their supply and where they're being mined at the moment. And talking of mining at the moment, there is one thing that I really should say um, when I'm talking about these raw materials, and that's about the scale of the markets. Because actually in terms of mining of metals and ores worldwide, at the moment we mine vast amounts of iron ore for steel. And all these other metals and ores fit into that, that blue box. So everything else is a much smaller, orders of magnitude smaller than mining of iron ore. But you can see the next biggest metals that we mine are things like aluminium, manganese, copper. Uh, nickel, of course, is in there. As we come down into what might be considered more the technology metals, we're getting to much smaller volumes of material being mined. So for things like lithium and cobalt for batteries, we are looking at smaller volumes. And the rare earth elements and the platinum group elements, even smaller volumes. These are really quite tiny markets still. And that's part of the problem and why they're referred to so much as critical. But of course, the really important point about that now is that those markets are growing. Demand for these raw materials is growing really fast, and especially for those that are used in batteries. And these, are, these diagrams are from the International Energy Agency's report uh, from last year, I think. Just showing, the one on the left shows the overall expected increase in demand for mineral raw materials to 2040. And you can see that depending on which exact scenario you choose, you're looking at four to six times as much total mineral demand as we had in 2020. That's an awful lot of mining. And if you look at specific minerals, now the IEA is a bit uh, gung-ho in its estimates, and some of the other estimates are more conservative. They're saying that by 2040, we might need 40 times as much lithium as we did in 2020. Other estimates are more like five times as much. It's still an awful lot more lithium, an awful lot more graphite, more cobalt, more nickel, even more rare earths. So demand for these minerals is really growing. And somebody is going to ask the question, so I'm going to head that off now. Well, what about recycling? And of course, recycling is going to be really important. By the end of this century, we might be approaching something like a circular economy for many of these raw materials. But right now, almost every electric vehicle that's ever been made is still on the road. There's nothing to recycle. There just aren't enough batteries out there that have reached the end of their lives to be recycling them. And of course, recycling is a big industry. You have to set that up, battery recycling, and that's only really just starting. So again, going back to the IEA, they reckon that, you know, really optimistically, maybe in 2040, we might be getting 10% of our mineral demand for some of these minerals from recycling. So when you look at all of that, that means that we need primary geological resources. We're going to need to go out there and mine them. And that, of course, is where we as geologists and geochemists really come in. And what I'm going to do is look at a couple of the things that I think are really important and just highlight some of the research that we've done in these areas. So first of all, one of the other questions I often get asked is, are we going to run out of some of these critical raw materials? You know, is there enough in the earth? And the answer, of course, is pretty much always yes. 
These critical raw materials form a really wide range of different deposit types. It's quite easy sometimes for people to think, for example, lithium only comes from the Salt Lakes in South America. Of course, that's not true. For almost every critical raw material, we have deposit types that are high temperature, formed by igneous or metamorphic processes. For example, nickel and cobalt are formed in mafic to ultramafic layered intrusions as a, a sulfide mineralization. If we're looking for graphite, we want to go and look at high grade metamorphic rocks that started life as carbon rich sediments. If we're looking for manganese, we're often going to be looking at sedimentary deposits. But then we can also look at deposits that were formed by low temperature processes at the Earth's surface, whether those be ferromanganese crusts on the seafloor, or whether they are lithium brines in the salt lakes, or even, for example, laterites. So for nickel, cobalt, and the rare earth elements, a really good source is weathered igneous rocks, uh, where you find those in the laterites. So a whole range of different deposit types that we can be looking at. And what are the real challenges towards mining these critical raw materials? You know, why are we talking about them so much? Why don't we just have mines for them all over the world? Well, there's a range of different challenges. The first one is, for some of these critical raw materials, they haven't been that well studied up until recently because they haven't been needed that much. So we need to understand the complete mineral system. We need to have widely applicable exploration geomodels. So those exist uh, for copper. Somewhere in this room probably is Rich Goldvarb, who's had a session on orogenic gold. And for orogenic gold, we have a pretty good understanding, even though it is all continuously evolving. Uh, but we have a pretty good understanding of the geomodels. That is just not true for some of these critical raw materials. And we need exploration techniques to be able to go and look for them as well. Some of the classic techniques uh, don't apply to some of the critical raw materials. For example, it's very difficult to look for lithium uh, using magnetic techniques. And then there's the whole mining value chain. And this is something that is really poorly understood, I think, in the public, for example. So of course, when we go and mine, we're not, as I saw in a recent media article, we are not mining batteries. It's a lovely idea, this big seam of batteries sitting there underground. And, and that is how sometimes the media are referring to it. But of course, we're exploring. We're identifying a mineral deposit, and when that mineral deposit is identified and you start mining, you mine ore. And ore, of course, is made up of a lot of different minerals. So first of all, you have to separate out your ore minerals. And then, unless they happen to be gold or diamonds, but in any other case, you've got your ore mineral, now you have to process it to get out the elements that you need. And this is the step that's often poorly understood, that mineral processing step is absolutely vital. And you have to have that capability as well as the capability to mine. And then even when you've processed the minerals, you've produced a, um, a compound or an element that you can sell, then of course there's several steps in manufacturing before you get anywhere near an electric vehicle. So these are complex value chains. And that mineral processing really affects which deposits are suitable for mining. And so that's a really important part of what we need to do as geologists. And then, of course, there's everything else. There's the economics, there's the environmental, there's the social concerns, uh, and there's governance, depending on which countries you're, you're working in. So there's an awful lot of barriers that, come, that affect us being able to mine these critical raw materials in the best, most sustainable way. And so all too often, we end up with the situation here where um, you have a group of geologists standing, looking at a mineral deposit, and all of them have a different idea about what you need to do. Um, Yindra, you are in the middle of that picture, and now you're in the middle of the audience, so that's fitting. So I'm going to look at a couple of those kind of issues that I've just raised, and just talk about some of the research that we've done recently. And I'm just going to give you a spoiler. I'm afraid there's not an awful lot of geochemistry in here because I'm going to be looking quite high level at some work that kind of pulls together a lot of geochemistry as a basis. So let's start by looking at exploration geomodels and focusing on the rare earth elements. 
So the rare earths are, of course, the 15 lanthanides plus scandium and yttrium. And there, they have a range of technology uses. There's a, um, some pretty obscure defense uses, which are uh, why Donald Trump wanted to buy Greenland, but we won't think about that. Um, but of course, there's neodymium for magnets and motors. That's the most important use for the energy transition. And we have a range of different deposit types, as we always do. The high temperature deposits in particular, we're thinking about the alkaline rocks and carbonatites. So those weird and wonderful magmas, either very rich in the alkalis or with carbonate predominating over silicate minerals. But also a whole range of low temperature deposits, mineral sands, uh, laterites, and what we call the iron adsorption clays, where the rare earths are actually adsorbed onto clay surfaces. Those are big sources of rare earths around the world and also carbonatites that have been weathered and upgraded by weathering. We could be producing the rare earth elements as byproducts of niobium, aluminium, or phosphate mining. The top picture is actually a phosphate mine in Russia. It's not a rare earth element mine at all. But we're not really doing much production of rare earth elements as byproducts worldwide. In fact, our global production, as you can see from the pie chart, is absolutely dominated by China. And the big gray area that you see shown for Burma or Myanmar, well, that's iron adsorption deposits along the Chinese border, uh, where the, the produced chemicals go straight into China. In fact, in the last decade, when I've been really focusing on the rare earth elements, there haven't been any new hard rock mines outside China. The last new rare earth mine of any scale to develop was Mount Weld in Australia. Uh, there's Mountain Pass in California, which has kind of opened and closed many times in recent years. And then there's a few other smaller mines. And um, this map you can download free from the BGS website if, you, if you're interested. And this map shows the sort of spread of known deposits and mines around the world. Bigger circles indicate where the mines are. And the colors, which you may not be able to see very well, uh, indicate the type of deposits, so alkaline rocks or carbonatites, etc. What you can see from this is that the rare earth elements aren't rare. There's plenty of deposits on every continent, but just not many of them are being mined. In North America, there's just mountain pass being mined, despite a whole range of different deposits. In Brazil, there's a tiny amount of production as a byproduct of niobium. In Africa, again, tiny amounts of production in Burundi and Madagascar. In Australia, plenty of deposits, only Mount Well being mined. And in Europe, we've not been able to get any rare earth element mines open. So still, so much of the world's production is coming from China. And one of the things that we've been working on over the last few years is really trying to... Um, to understand those geomodels for these mineral deposits so that we can uh, give the companies that are exploring an idea of what they should be looking for so that they can actually identify the best deposits that are most likely to be able to come into production. Now this is a diagram from a paper that I pulled together on rare earth element deposits in Europe uh, in 2016. Uh, and this diagram gets pretty widely used. You might have seen, seen it. It might even have been used in some presentations here. But it's really quite simple. And it's basically saying alkaline rocks and carbonatites form in really a couple of different settings, one of which is the intracontinental rift or interplate setting, where they may be associated with mantle plumes or they may not be. Um, and that's the kind of classic setting in which we understand alkaline rocks and carbonatites to exist. And then we pointed out that although you don't find them in real subduction alkaline type volcanism, in post-collisional settings, you also do get alkaline rocks and carbonatites. And we pointed out at that time, there was a bit of you know, difference between the deposit types in those different settings. And since then, what we've been doing is pulling together a lot of data, the kind of data that so many people are presenting here, uh, individual deposit scale data or experimental work and kind of pulling it together to try and develop a widely applicable deposit model for each of those different types of deposit in the different settings. 
So let's start with the alkaline silicate igneous complexes. And these are pretty amazing igneous intrusions. They are giant complexes. I'm going to be talking uh, in the next couple of slides about a paper that's just come out in economic geology, led by Charlie Beard. And this is a diagram from that paper. And it shows, at the same scale, various different alkaline silicate igneous intrusions around the world. And you can see some of these are 10 up to 30, maybe even 50 kilometers across. And these are mineralogically really strange things. A huge proportion of the different minerals that we know are actually found in these alkaline igneous intrusions. And some of them are essentially the world's largest rare earth element deposits because they're huge. They contain rare earth bearing minerals, maybe at moderately high grade, not very high grade. But you know, they look like, well, you could just mine one of these and you would have all the rare earths you need. But that's not so. And that is because of that mineralogy. The mineralogy is incredibly complex and that means mineral processing is really challenging. This is not at all low hanging fruit, in fact. So it's really important to understand that detailed deposit scale geology so that we can look at well, where there might be parts of, the, parts of the intrusion that actually are most amenable to mining and indeed to processing. And Charlie's paper, what he's actually done is, uh, is create a kind of almost 3D schematic model of one of these igneous systems uh, that we can use to show where the most rare earth mineralized parts of the system are. So this is the sort of overview of the whole system with the um, carefully uh, vague mafic cumulate stroke mush zone at depth. Um, I'm sure there's a few people here who would tell me we haven't quite got this right, but um, hopefully it's vague enough. But then with the upper intrusion showing the different phases in that alkaline igneous complex. And, um, and if we look at this cross section through it, and I would urge you to look at the paper if you're interested, because there you can actually look at the 3D PDF and kind of scroll around this 3D visualization. But this diagram uh, is actually the product of a huge amount of assimilation of a huge amount of work, even although it looks quite simple, because this is giving us the information about where in those giant alkaline silicate intrusions you would actually find rare earth mineralization. And the answer is that most commonly it can be in the cumulates, but most commonly it's in the late stage intrusions. You can see the kind of green intrusion shown cutting across there. And you can see the peralkaline granite in the top corner. These are the latest stages in these alkaline igneous intrusions. And that's where you want to go for your mineralization. Uh, Strange Lake, for example, in Canada is a really good example of that. But then there's also the roof stones. Because, of course, in these, in these uh, magma chambers, you have volatiles, often with the incompatible elements, collecting near the roof. And that roof zone type deposit is one that's not been all that well understood. And that's another location where you can potentially find enrichment in the rare earth elements. So I'm not going to go into more detail in this, but again, I would say, have a look at the paper. And then carbonatites, carbonatites in intraplate systems are another really important kind of potential deposit of the rare earth elements and a major focus for exploration. This diagram is not mine. I just put it in because it's so cool. Okay, this is from Gregory Yaxley and colleagues, their um, recent paper in Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And it really shows you the different stages in formation of a carbonatite and the different minerals that are forming. So, Absolutely brilliant paper. Again, I do urge you to have a look at it, even though I have to say I didn't have anything to do with it. And the type area, of course, for these carbonatites, yes, the East African Reft or Odonio Lengai. I've been lucky enough to go there. I hope some of you have as well. Amazing place, the only carbonatite volcano in the world. And of course, that's the uh, exemplar for the top of this diagram. But as you go deeper, as you look at the older carbonatites, you find that, again, the rare earth enrichment is in the late stages, so iron-rich carbonatites commonly. They can form late pegmatites and dikes in these carbonatites. Now, if I asked you, where are all the world's rare earth element deposits? Many people would probably say, well, this is the answer. They're in the carbonatites, 
in the rift systems. How many of these do you think are being mined primarily for rare earths around the world? None. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a two down here. I said primarily for rare earths, so um, Avishar's not counting. Um, so Mount Weld, which is weathered, so the weathered zone is being mined, not the hard rocks. This is where it's at. The post-collisional alkaline carbonatite complexes. So these are complexes where you've got alkaline rocks that they might not be the most peralkaline intrusions, but they'll be rich in potassium, strontium, barium, fluorine, the light rare earths. Probably poor in niobium. They've got a quite subduction-like signature. You've got a, a source in the mantle that's been really juiced up by subduction-related fluids. And with these things, you normally have an alkaline intrusion that might not look that exciting. The rare earths may even be enriched in the mafic cumulus at the base of what was the magma chamber. You might have cyanites, phone lights, but they might not look that interesting. But these very volatile rich alkaline magmas, you get liquid immiscibility in those magma chambers and it produces uh, carbonates, or Roger Mitchell would call them carbothermal residua, uh, but I'd say carbonatites. And they're enriched in the light rare earth, barium, strontium, fluorine, etc. And they form these they rise up through the crust and they form kind of dikes and sheets and lenses and so on. And they typically have quite simple mineralogy, rare earth carbonates like bastnazite or maybe monazite. I've been talking to a few people about monazite here. And as a rare earth phosphate, it's one of the easiest minerals to process for the rare earth elements. Most of the hard rock mines for rare earths in the world, including Mountain Pass, Maniaping, Bayanobo, and several other significant prospects are in this type of system. And some of you might have seen recently, if you've been watching maybe Twitter or watching the media, apparently Turkey's got a newfound cache of rare earths. And they had their um, president, I think, standing, or one of their ministers, standing in front of a, an old adit pointing at rare earths. That's the Kizoljuran deposit in Turkey. We talk about it in this paper. I, I went to it five years ago. Part of this kind of simplified cross section is based on it because it has lovely uh, fluorite, barite, bastnazite, or lenses that look just like what we see in this diagram. But the media have suddenly got all excited because of an announcement by a minister. So much of all of this around critical raw materials is actually politics. And as geologists, we really have a, it's so important that we are there saying, well, actually, this is the facts. You know, this is what's going on. So that was the rare earth elements, a bit whistle-stop tour through some of the uh, work that we've been doing recently. Uh, and now I'm going to look quickly at lithium. And lithium is the really hot topic right now. Everyone is interested in lithium. Uh, Rob Bowell is here somewhere. I see you, Rob. And uh, Rob has been writing about lithium recently uh, in Elements, for example, and just getting that information out there about lithium deposits and the different types. And talking of the different types of lithium deposits, again, of course, there are several. The most important ones, there's hard rock deposits, so there's lithium-rich pegmatites, granitic pegmatites that are rich in lithium, and also just granites that are rich in lithium. But pegmatites are mined, particularly in Australia, and provide huge part of the world's lithium today. But then we have sedimentary deposits where lithium rich fluids have flowed through sedimentary basins. You might get uh, clays or you might get borates that are rich in lithium. Yadar in Serbia is a great example. Of course, lithium rich brines in the Salars or salt flats of the Andes are another very important source of lithium worldwide. But there's also potential for direct lithium extraction from geothermal brines circulating underground. In the UK, that's happening in Cornwall. But there's many other examples where that's a potential source of lithium. And of course, it could be associated with heat or power from geothermal. And I'm not going to talk about geomodels for lithium, uh, lithium deposits, particularly pegmatites, or about the sources of lithium pegmatites. But I'm very happy to do that if anyone wants to come and chat to me, as long as you don't mind me going like this for hours. So just another map showing global lithium mines occurrences and deposits. Um, and again, lithium really is not rare. In fact, I've started telling people that most countries will have a, a lithium 
deposit of some kind. Maybe not the Netherlands, but most other countries. <laughs> and um, what you can see here, the red is the pegmatites and granites, the blues and yellows are the brines and the volcanoes, volcano sedimentary systems. And what you can see here is it's that um, western coast of the Americas where we have an active margin. That's where we have a lot of uh, brine type deposits, volcano sedimentary type deposits, because ultimately the ultimate source of lithium is in subduction zones and is in the volcanics above subduction zones. But uh, as I, I heard somebody talking this morning, of course, lithium is incredibly mobile. As soon as you get it onto the Earth's surface, it's going to find its way into water and you're going to have brines circulating in the Earth's crust. So the pegmatites and granites are um, kind of all over the world, typically in areas of older crust in collisional belts. So again, uh, parts of the US and Canada, Brazil, Australia, much of Africa, China again, of course, Europe. This map has a, a basic error, which is that we have nothing in Russia and Central Asia. But of course, there are loads of lithium-rich pegmatites and granites across Russia and Central Asia. It's just that the information is not always that widely available because these things haven't had that much study by international teams, if you like. So again, yeah, key thing is lithium is not rare. And I'm just going to focus in for a bit on lithium pegmatites uh, because this is something that I'm working on a lot at the moment. And these are tabular igneous bodies, meters to tens of meters, occasionally hundreds of meters thick, uh, formed throughout geological time in areas of continental collision. Can be steep dipping, can be shallow. Typically, you find them in metasedimentary rocks or metamorphosed mafic rocks, and they'll have nice sharp contacts like this lovely white pegmatite here in the Bikita mine. Normally, whenever you go to a pegmatite mine, you will see beautiful white pegmatite contrasting against very dark country rocks. And I've put up this figure here from Mike Wise's recent paper in Canadian Mineralogist because it's really always been thought that lithium pegmatites were zoned in a very classic way, that classic way being broadly the simple zonation you see there. But more recently, as people have spent more time looking at lithium pegmatites, we've realized that no, they're far more complicated than that. Some of them are very simple. Some of them are full of cavities, myrolytic cavities, some of them are full of replacement zones and are very complex things. So there's no one size fits all. And in fact, that is generally the case with lithium pegmatites. Every time you think, oh yeah, I found something that's common to all of them, you find something that's, you find another one that's different. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about lithium mineralogy because this is so important for the reasons that I mentioned earlier about processing. So each pegmatite contains different lithium minerals in different proportions. Of course, it's an igneous rock. Um, and there's just some of the lithium minerals we might be looking for. Spodumene, petalite, eucryptite, lepidolite, and bligonite, a whole host of others as well. There's a real range of different lithium ore minerals. And also, these pegmatites will often contain columbite tantalite. They'll contain cassiterite. They might contain polycite, which is the cesium ore mineral. And what you do with those different minerals really affects the economics of your mine. So, for example, spodumene, it's great. It's a pretty simple mineral. It's mostly really just lithium, aluminium, and silica. It doesn't take up that much in the way of impurities. And so that's processed for batteries because you need high purity lithium chemicals for batteries. Petalite, slightly harder to process, is currently being used mostly for ceramics, in fact and not for batteries at all. And then lipidolite, the lithium mica. Well, this, of course, is it's a mica. It's a bucket for impurities. We all know that. And while there is processing for lipidolite now being developed, and a lot of talk about lipidolite deposits, it's not being mined commercially anywhere in the world as yet. So knowing your lithium mineralogy is really important. Uh, and then you also have to understand your parogenesis. And to talk about that, I'm going to just go through a bit of an example from the Kamativi pegmatite in Zimbabwe. And this is work principally done by my colleague Richard Shaw, who's in that photograph, and published recently in Canadian Mineralogist. So the Kamativi pegmatite, it's a 30 or 40 meters thick, and it's beautifully exposed because it was mined in the past for tin, 
but it is a lithium bearing pegmatite. And when you go there, it's pretty simple. In fact, there's the host rocks, which are, um, this is Archean, um, no, sorry, Paleoproterozoic kind of greenstone belt. So these are mica schists mostly. There's a very sharp contact. There's a border zone, which has uh, some tourmaline and muscovite in it. And then you get into the core of the pegmatite and you've got about 30 meters of this banded pegmatite, rhythmically banded. And when you look at a photograph from the core, there's basically two main bands. There's the coarse grain bands, which have large feldspar crystals and nice big spodumene crystals. Lovely, looks like a great lithium deposit. Then there's these fine grain bands, which contain a lot of albite, and that's where the cassiterite and the tantalite are found. So that's what was really being mined for the tin. Even better, you'd think. We've had anthropogenic upgrading. They've removed the tin and those finer grain bands, and what should be left in the tailings is mostly spodumene and feldspar. Of course, it's not that simple. So when Rich started looking at the thin sections from Kama TV, what he found, first of all, was uh, things like this. This is a cross-polarized image of a whole thin section. And cutting across the middle, you can see a band that's rich in bladed albite. And that's the latest uh, phase in this thin section. Well, no, it's not actually. There's a later band cutting across lower down that looks like a fracture. But what you can see to the left and right is spodumene quartz intergrowth. And you can see the quartz looks pretty clean. But the spodumene looks pretty mucky in this. And in fact, uh, spodumene quartz intergrowth is a really common texture in pegmatites known as squee. Uh, but here the spodumene is really, really altered. And in fact, when Rich started doing some SEM mapping, what he found was, although the initial phase that you saw in these pegmatites was probably mostly spodumene quartz and feldspar, it's been huge amounts of replacement. These pegmatites, they have stewed in their own juices. So for example, in this map, uh, the blue is mostly albite, the yellow is quartz. Uh, and the little boxes are picking up the darker blues and reds, which are your cassiterite and your columbite tantalite. You can't see any significant amounts of spodumene left in this sample. The K feldspar and the spodumene have been completely replaced by albite. So we've got a sort of sodic residual melt that is, go that is completely altering the pegmatite. And associated with that, we're bringing in tin and tantalum. But then we're uh, crystallizing albite, but breaking down the K feldspar. And so then we go to a phase of potassic alteration, of grisonization. And in this image, there's a bit of spodumene left, which is the red mineral. You can see it looks pretty unhappy. The yellow is quartz, the purple is muscovite, blue again is albite. Uh, and so you can see we've got extensive muscovite quartz replacement and a bit of spodumene left. But you can see that some of the spodumene is altering to this pink stuff, and that is cookieite, uh, a lithium sheet silicate. And what we see is that as you go to lower temperatures in these pegmatites, you get almost complete replacement of spodumene by quartz and cookieite. The cookieite is the kind of purple colors here. The muscovite is the darker purple. So this pegmatite, which, you know, when we look at it in hand specimen, looks like it's got big spodumenes in. Actually, quite a bit of the lithium is in this thing called cookieite. And well, no one really knows how to process that. So this is the parogenesis we worked out at Camera TV. Well, I should say Rich worked out. Um, the first stage, the magmatic stage, lovely. Quartz, feldspar, spodumene, um, a few other minerals, maybe a bit of tourmaline. If you could capture your pegmatite at that point, you've got an amazing lithium deposit. But almost every pegmatite that I read about in the literature, um, although Cat Breezley's poster, which some of you may have seen last night, did refer to Tanko, and that's got those pretty clean magmatic assemblages. But almost every other pegmatite you read about has at least two stages of the alteration in this parogenesis. So we've got albitization first, the sodic alteration. Then we've got grisonization, the potassic alteration. And then we've got those low temperature alteration to sheet silicates and eventually potentially clays. So this is really important. And this is where as geologists, geochemists, mineralogists, we really come in because 
Any exploration company is going to focus on the size of the deposit, the tonnage, and the grade, the amount of lithium that's in there. But actually, the most important thing of all is what minerals are the lithium, is the lithium in? How much alteration is there? Is it consistent enough that you can plan and can you process it? And this is really quite a significant issue if you want to go and mine lithium. And I've been saying to a lot of students recently, this is why you have to do mineralogy. Good, classic mineralogy is so important. There we go. Mineralogical variations just have that fundamental impact. And the buzzword, the term for that is geometallurgy. So I'm kind of coming to the end. That's a couple of examples of the sort of work that we're doing. But I can't finish without mentioning the importance of all the other things that wrap around the geology. It's mining. It has to be economic. But now, more than ever, if we're going to be mining these critical raw materials, we've got to meet the best environmental, social, and governance standards. And we can. Mining can be done really well. Uh, it can be beneficial to local communities. It can be well regulated, well governed, and well managed. It just isn't always. Um, and we can contribute to that in many ways. One of the ways, and this is from a paper published last year, is using life cycle assessment to look at the impacts of that whole mining value chain. And things like deposit models and geometallurgy are critical to feed into that. So we can really inform that kind of work. But we also need to consider the impacts that are much more local to the mine. I know there's been some talks here on things like remediation of mine waste. And to do all of this, as geologists and geochemists, we also need to work with environmental scientists. We need to work with social scientists. We need to work with policymakers. We need to work with local communities and civil society. You know, being linked in to all those aspects of what's going on around a mine is so important. And, you know, the key point is we have to mine these raw materials, but we have to do it right. So there's my conclusions. We need a really wide range of critical raw materials. We will not get to net zero without them. If we don't mine these raw materials, we are going to carry on extracting fossil fuels instead. And so that's not going to help anyone. And although recycling will be really important right now, that has to come from the Earth's crust. We need primary natural resources. And as geologists and geochemists, we're going to be instrumental in, in finding those deposits and making sure that they are mined as efficiently as possible. But really importantly, we have to collaborate. We need to work with people in environmental science, social science policy. We need to make sure that mining is done as responsibly as possible. So ultimately, it's up to all of us to, to get involved in that and to say we need to mine, but we need to do it as well as we possibly can. Thank you very much. So many thanks to Catherine for a great presentation. We have obviously time for questions, so please Come to the microphone. I can see already Adina. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for a wonderful talk. You focused on mining, and that's the traditional common way of obtaining minerals, uh, um, elements, mostly because of the concentration. I was wondering if anyone, any place is thinking about focusing on uh, vast reservoirs with low concentrations like the ocean. I think if you calculate there's more lithium in the ocean than in all of these deposits, it may be a new technology, it may be more complicated, but is this something we should start thinking about? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And um, all of these kind of low-grade almost deposits, you know, the ocean, for example, is a low-grade deposit of lithium. And direct lithium extraction is a technology that may well lead to us eventually being able to, to use use the ocean effectively through desalination to get lithium. And something else that people often say to me is, well, why, you know, are we going to be mining the deep sea? Are we going to be mining the moon? That kind of thing. And what I always say is, this, if you look at all the aluminium that has been produced around the world, aluminium produces a waste called red, called red mud. And there are red mud lakes 
or you know, dried out stockpiles around the world. And for example, for rare earth elements and for various other elements, those lakes of red mud waste contain all that we need. So if we could just extract the rare earths from those waste lakes, we'd have the rare earths we needed. The problem is always the technology. It's always making it economic to use the technologies that we have to actually extract these quite low grade resources. But I think you're absolutely right. I think more and more that's going to come. So, so yeah, I have another marine question. Um, and um, after about a 30 year or so hiatus, there seems to be a resurgence of interest in mining manganese nodules in the deep sea. Uh, and I was just curious what your thoughts are on that in the context of some of this other stuff. Yeah, I know it's a really good question. And some of my colleagues have been working on that because obviously it is really important that we try and understand what deposits there are on the seafloor, so in the nodules and the crusts. Um, it's also really important that we understand the, those environments and what the impacts might be of mining. I guess the thing that I always come back to with deep sea mining is mining is fundamentally driven by economics. And it's never going to be more economic to mine on the seafloor than it is to mine, you know, in my backyard. The problem is a lot of people don't want mining in their backyards. And I think that's the only reason actually why we would end up with deep sea mining is because it's out of sight, out of mind, just as at the moment, a lot of mines in China for most of us are out of sight, out of mind. So actually what, I'm, what I would say is we should all be prepared to accept a mine, maybe not in our backyards, but maybe in that area that we, you know, quite like to go walking our dog occasionally, but actually it wouldn't really matter if there was some infrastructure there. You know, so I think there's a need for a societal change so that we can actually use the deposits that are quite readily available to us. And then we won't need to think about deep sea mining, certainly not in our lifetimes. Good, thanks. Rocky. <laughs> How can I miss ask you a question? Thank you very much, Catherine, for this very, very nice talk now. So if you look back half a year, huh, your talk would be brilliantly posted, right? Now we have the event in Ukraine. So this actually bombs us back. We see now a new uh, carbon hydro technology is coming back. So how you really post that now with the new political dis uh, a situation that's going on, but because this is an argument to use again hydrocarbons to go for nuclear again, right? So how would you actually balance those two things? Yeah, I mean, you've absolutely hit the spot, Rocky. Ultimately, politics governs so much of this. And there has been something interesting as well, because of course, Russia is um, one of the world's largest producers of nickel that we need for batteries, about 10% of all the world's nickel. And although, as you say, this has pushed us back towards thinking about fossil fuels, it has also made, well, various governments, but definitely the UK government, suddenly realise that critical minerals are important. Uh, but yes, the politics are huge drivers for all of this. And I guess, again, that's something that we can do. You know, we all have the chance to influence in whatever way we can uh, to give the evidence, for example, that yes, we have enough of these critical raw materials. We need to find effective ways of mining them so we can produce the batteries we need, that kind of thing. So I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Politics is a huge issue. Let's do what we can to demonstrate that we can do these things. We can have an energy transition based on mineral raw materials. Hi, Catherine, thank you very much um, for your talk. It was really interesting. So I guess my question is uh, sort of like a broad scale thing. So in all of the maps you showed of where these deposits are, um, they're all in quite rural areas. And we've just spoken about how, you know, we'll have to maybe move into our back gardens. But how do we mitigate the environmental impact uh, of not only mining those places, but getting those resources to other places in the world? Um, without, you know, making everyone really upset. <laughs> that is, it is a brilliant question. In fact, that really is the question. Uh, and of course, there's so many different environmental impacts because there are the, 
the emissions and the kind of global scale impacts associated with mining and with transport. In fact, the um, uh, people at Rio Tinto will tell you the net zero mine is not far away. Obviously, take that with a little pinch of salt, but certainly electrification of mining, for example, is happening. Um, Obviously, you then have to be getting that electricity from hydropower, for example, for it to be considered net zero. But again, we talked about hydrogen. The hydrogen economy may well lead to uh, being able to use hydrogen for big mining trucks, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of different possibilities. So in terms of those, emission, those environmental impacts, the CO2 emissions, I think that will come as we move towards electrifying um, transport and to using clean energy. The more challenging impacts are the local ones. Uh, and, but a lot of that is down to perception. Uh, for example, uh, I'm working with a PhD student who recently published a lovely paper looking at a nickel mine in Madagascar. And the idea had been that having this nickel mine in Madagascar would destroy some forests. And of course, Madagascar's nearly lost all its forests anyway. But in fact, when they set up the nickel mine, they committed to protecting the forest. And of course, Madagascar's forest uh, is getting lost mostly because of poverty, because people need, they need wood, uh, they need space to grow their rice, etc. cetera. They, they need fuel. And so the mine protected, committed to protecting the forest. And only about 15 years later, uh, it's already possible to show by some very careful analysis and modeling that that mine has caused no net loss of forest. In other words, although they've had to clear some forest for the mine footprint, they've been able to protect forest elsewhere. Uh, and that, so that kind of thing, you know, and I've been to many mines where in fact, the biodiversity is better protected around the mine because that mining company has committed to doing it. Of course, I've been to some rubbish mines as well, undoubtedly, <laughs> but you know, it is possible. And, and again, with communities, uh, proper, open early dialogue with communities can mean that the community benefits as well so all of these things are possible it's just a question of making sure that best practice is being followed wherever possible and of course because economics is always the driver for all of this that does make it hard sometimes but thank you great question Félix Gervais, Polytechnique, Montreal. Uh, I have some, some question about the timing of all these things in terms of uh, we need critical metal fast, but as you mentioned, uh, it takes time to build a robust geological models for all these. You touch upon some of these issues, but we haven't even spoke about like the, the, the structural complexities of these intrusions of where they are, where, where should we look where, in origins, which are very, very big. So it takes lots of time to, to, to build ge robust geological model, but we need critical metal now. So what's your, like as a, as a scientist, I'm always puzzling, is it, is it worth, is it worth spending all this time to, to, to do that? Like, well, what's your take on that? Yeah, no, you've hit on the really the most important point. I would say most people agree that unless everything goes very, very smoothly, from sort of discovery through to having a mine, you're looking at best at about 10 years. As you say, it takes time to build those robust models. It takes time to evidence that this is worth mining. It takes time to work out the processing flow sheets. It takes time. To, to do all that work with communities, to deal with the environmental impacts, to do all the permitting, everything. Take, it's going to take a decade unless you're very lucky. Um, this is a big problem. I'd like to say I have a great solution to it. I don't. It is a big problem. We need to be getting some of those mines open now. For example, for lithium, there is an uh, increase in kind of existing mines. So in Australia and in Chile and Argentina, they've stepped up to provide the lithium we need now. But that's kind of stopped investment in that many new mines that we're really going to need in five years. So yeah, it's, it's, you have hit on the big problem. I'm going to turn back to the seafloor mining. Um, you, you mentioned the important point that it's always easier to do it on land than under the oceans. But what about the environmental costs as well? Because great, mining these very low-grade deposits 
is an incredible destruction of habitat. And unfortunately, perhaps sometimes at the bottom of the food chain where we need it the most. Do you have any comments on how that's going to influence our use of seafloor mining? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And um, some of the mention, particularly of low-grade deposits on the seafloor, to be honest, I just think it's absolute rubbish. It's for the rare earths, Japan will tell you that they have this wonderful resource of rare earths because they have these muds on the seafloor at great depth, and that that is, you know, really important resource. But as I was just saying, there are wastes on land that have already been mined that have rare earths at the same sort of grade. So no, I think for deep sea mining, I definitely, I think we need to do the research. We need to know what's there. We also need to understand those habitats and those environments much better because that's valuable to understand anyway. And we need to have an idea of what the impacts would be. But I would, you know, personally, I don't think we should be mining the seafloor. You know, I really, I don't think that's the way to go. And I'm not convinced that actually it's going to be that successful. But I may be proven wrong, of course. Thank you. We have a Zoom question. Ah? We do have a Zoom question related to actually the increase of uranium and thorium in the environment relating um, as byproduct of the mining of the rare earth element. Mm -hmm. So would you like to comment on that? Yeah. Yeah, so someone's hit on something really important here. For the rare earth elements, there's not that many mines, certainly not outside of China, so it's hard to get kind of quantitative evidence about the impacts on the environment of rare earth element mining. But we do know that two of the main minerals often mined for rare earth elements are monazite and xenotime, and that they are radioactive. They have significant contents of uranium and or thorium. And so there's a lot of concern. A lot of people will just associate rare earth elements with radioactivity uh, and assume that mining anything, any rare earth, means radioactivity. Now, in some cases, it does. In India, they're mining monazite, mineral sands, and I think stockpiling the thorium. So you collect the thorium, you stockpile it in the hope that you will be able to use it in a nuclear reactor in the future. And that seems like a reasonable approach. But the really important thing is there's an awful lot of rare earth element deposits that are not significant issues with uh, thorium and uranium because the ore mineral is bastnizite, and bastnizite is a rare earth carbonate. It doesn't really take up thorium and uranium. Uh, and those are relative, and of course, some of the weathered deposits as well are very low in thorium and uranium. So it's one of those concerns that can be really significant in certain deposits, doesn't apply to all rare earth element deposits. So again, it comes back to models, uh, good deposit models, good geometallurgy, making sure that you've, you're mining the right part of the deposit, you're doing the processing in the right way. Um, but yes, it's, the perception is that every rare earth element deposit is releasing thorium into the environment and it's a disaster, and that's not right. Um, I had a question about uh, the complex mineralogies and when you, try to process them, is it an economic issue that they are too expensive to process chemically, or is it actually the, the chemistry issue? I think it's a combination of everything. So in some cases, for example, if they're silicate minerals, so I'm, I'm not an expert at all on this, you know, I'm not a metallurgist, but I know there can be issues with, for example, kind of, you just can't get the flow sheet to work because you're getting clogging by silica, that kind of thing. So sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's economic, uh, so simply it's just too expensive, either you need too high temperatures or you need too aggressive acids or something like that. Um, and sometimes it's just impurities. Sometimes, yes, you can process the minerals, you can get out the elements you need, but they come with so many other impurities that it's very hard to sell them if you can't produce a pure enough product. And then just to follow up to that, if the you said that a number of these deposits can be actually sort of uh, created when we process another ore system. Is there incentive for a company to begin processing uh, their own waste in a kind of sort of more holistic life of mine uh, model? Do they know to, how to do it? Do they get incentives to do it? Or is it just the type of thing where they're allowed to just leave the, the, the red lake, so to speak, um, for somebody else to come through later? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, in an ideal world, 
I think any mine would have uh, would look at all the possible byproducts and co-products, and everything would be produced, whether it was economic or not. There's a few people involved in the mining industry here, and they're probably laughing at my uh, my enthusiasm for that. But no, of course, most companies will just get out what's economic, and if it's going to cost them more to get something else to put an extra stage into their processing so they can get something else out, even though environmentally that seems like the obvious thing to do. But if it's not economic in general, it won't be done. Thank you. There is there are, you know, it's moving a little bit towards incentives for do what's right for the environment, but we're not there yet. Okay. Hi, Catherine, can I ask you for one more question? We see a lot of speculative investment around the world. There are many projects which are unsuccessful only because of speculative investors, because of, of course, political issues. But this is not my question. What about Europe? For example, lithium. There are sources, economic, possibly economic sources of lithium in Europe. How do you see the future in Europe? Yeah, it's a great question, Yindra, and a really important one because um, the European Union has known for probably 15 years, they've been prioritizing these critical raw materials. They made the first list of critical raw materials. They've had a huge amount of research on them, which, uh, which Yindra, you and I have both benefited from. And yet, very few of these critical raw materials are being mined anywhere in Europe. There's no mine for the rare earth elements. Uh, lithium, there's small amounts of production in Spain and Portugal, but there's a lot of kind of protest about that. Um, we look at things like Yadar in Serbia, uh, which would have been a huge lithium mine, and now the mining license has been completely cancelled. It's really challenging because Europe needs secure supplies of many of these critical raw materials. If it was done, if the mining was done in Europe, it would be done to the best standards, which is really important. And yet, actually getting to the stage where you get past all the protests and you can set up a mine, no matter how well that mine is going to be run, seems to be really, really challenging. And I think this is a, this is a societal thing, it's a perception thing often. Many of the people who protest against mines actually probably won't have seen a mine. They don't may necessarily know that much about it and there is a communication piece here for all of us and for everybody involved in this industry which is around the fact that we need mining and if we do it well we should be doing it well in europe thank you thanks very much everyone some brilliant questions Yeah, let's thank again Catherine for a fantastic presentation. Thanks to all of you for participating in that plenary session and have a great day at the Goldschmidt. <laughs>